All right, so we are ready to look at how we can utilize the relationship between the equilibrium constant and the electrode potential to assess what happens when you have a metal with actual ligands bound to it. So for instance, you could be asking or you could be interested in finding out, okay, so we know that the reduction of copper two, which is what you have right here, to copper metal has a specific value based on the reduction potential. But that's if you have nothing other than copper two and you know the copper metal. So then the question arises as to well, what happens if the metal is wrapped around ligands other than water? How does the potential get affected? And in order to determine that, you're gonna have to apply a Hess's law type of cycle. This being the targeted equation. And the one thing to keep in mind is that this is copper two being reduced to copper zero. So you could start with that fact, the fact that you do know the potential for copper two to copper zero, which is 0 0.34 volts. And in addition to that, if you look at this, you can say, wait, wait a minute. Well, we have two, you have two ethylene diamines binding to copper forming this uh, this ethylene diamine copper two complex. So that kind of gives you the idea that since you're forming a complex, you're probably dealing with the formation constants. Specifically, just to remind you, the formation constant by definition is the naked ion plus the free ligands yielding the complex ion, right? So this is the balance equation corresponding to the KF. So you will have to be provided with these KF values in order to do what I'm about to show you. Now, the idea right here is that you want to manipulate the equation so that you have the overall equation. And the complex is not on the, re on the product side, it's actually on the reactant side. So this tells you that the first equation we have here needs to be flipped on itself. And that means that the KF value will need to be raised to the negative one power. All right, so we're gonna end up with 10 to the negative 21. And so when you add up these equations, you're going to have uh, the coppers canceling out, but then you're going to have complex plus two electrons yields copper metal plus two free ligands, exactly what we have in the desired equation. So now the question becomes, okay, we add the equations, we get what we want for the overall equation, but what the heck happens <laughs> to the reduction potential? How do we get that? And here you have to kind of remember that even though, even though the formation constant is not a redox event because it's an equilibrium constant we can actually convert it to a pseudo redox uh, potential specifically we can add the 0 0.34 volts of the reduction that we have here with not the 1 times 10 to the negative 20 value but rather the 0 0.0592 divided by n times the log of 10 to negative 20 and in terms of the value of n is literally what you see right here for the reduction it's a two. So you would basically, in an interesting fashion, convert the equilibrium constant in terms of a potential. Uh, now, by itself, the first equation here, what we're doing makes no sense because the first equation doesn't actually involve a reduction or oxidation. But because that equation is in conjunction with an actual reduction, we can treat it as if it were a redox uh, process because the whole thing together is going to come together to yield a redox process. So take the log of 10 to negative 20, you'll find out that's negative 20. Multiply by 0 0.0592 and divide by 2, you'll find out that the value is negative 0 0.592. And what that means is that the potential, oops, excuse me, the reduction potential is now going to be negative 0 0.25 volts. And this is kind of interesting to um, analyze because what this is telling you is that naked copper wants to be reduced but the moment you add ligands to it it no longer wants to be reduced and the reason being is because the ligands are supplying electron density to that metal and so you already have higher electron density around the metal so having two electrons come in to carry out the reduction is not going to be all that favorable on top of that you're fighting against the fact that the formation of the complex that you had to begin with is a favorable process. This complex wants to be formed. So you adding the electrons and destroying the complex implies that you are gonna have to destroy that attractive interaction between the ligand and the copper two center. Uh, and unfortunately in this case, the positive potential of the copper reduction is not enough to counteract the fact that the formation constant is so large.
So it's kind of interesting to look at it from all those points of view. All right, now that's if you're going from the complex to the naked neutral metal. But what happens if you just have a plain reduction of one complex yielding a new complex? For instance, what if we have the cobalt-3 complex, the tris-ethylene diamine cobalt-3 complex acquiring an electron and yielding tris-ethylene diamine cobalt-2? Well, what this means is that we have a reduction happening, specifically cobalt-3 is turning into cobalt-2. So that will be the first equation to keep in mind. The second one has to do with the fact that we're forming the cobalt-3 complex, so we have a formation constant associated with it. Uh, we also have a cobalt 2 plus complex, so we'll have a formation constant for that as well. And yes, don't forget the actual reduction. So now you have three equations to consider. And the two with the formation of the complex have equilibrium constants you know, applied to them. The first one, which is just a reduction, has the reduction potential. And so we just need to manipulate these equations to come up with what we have here. We are undergoing a reduction, so we keep the cobalt-3 to cobalt-2 the way it is. But as a reactant, we have the cobalt-3 complex. So we need to take this third equation and flip it. And the moment you flip that equation, you raise the equilibrium constant to the negative 1 power. All right, other than that, the cobalt-2 complex is exactly where we want it. We have the electron where we want it. So we can now add these equations together. We will cancel out the cobalt-2 pluses, we will cancel out the cobalt-3 pluses, which are naked, and we will, of course, cancel out the free ligands. And so we'll end up with simply cobalt-3 complex plus electron yields cobalt-2 complex. All right, now, in terms of the process, you have the reduction potential of cobalt-3 to cobalt-2. You have the formation constant of the cobalt-2 complex, and you have the reverse of the conversion or the formation of the cobalt-3 complex. So all you have to do now is simply adapt these values together and for the equilibrium constants you're going to use the relationship between the potential and the equilibrium constant. So you have 0 0.0592 divided by n times the log of 8.7 times 10 to negative 3 plus, times, excuse me, plus the log of 4.9 times 10 to negative 48 raised to the negative 1 power which is the same thing as saying the log of 1 over 4.9 times 10 to the negative 48. So you could actually just bring those things together within one log. You could keep it in a separate log as well, if you please. That's totally up to you. But, you know, this kind of simplifies the picture a little bit. This goes on top because you have no negative exponent. This goes on the bottom because of the negative exponent. All right. And so what ends up happening is that you divide the two numbers together inside the logarithm. You take the log, oh, and also we're only dealing with one electron, so n equals 1. So 8.7 times 10 to the 13 power divided by 4.9 times 10 to the 48 power. If you take the log of that, you get negative 34.7. Multiply by 0 0.0592 yields negative 2.06. And when we apply that to the potential, the reduction potential, we find out that this is negative 0.2. And so the reduction is a little... Um, is a little disfavor based on the potential being negative and that's because the ethylene diamine ligands are present in there and they prefer to be with a metal that has a higher charge as opposed to one that has a lower charge and the thing i particularly love about this process is, is that it's relatively simplistic it is it has a slow cycle mind you and you do need to apply the conversion of the equilibrium constants to the potential but when you look at the experimental value, the actual experimental value, the one that we calculated on, you know, pretty much paper, um, is very close to the true value. So I personally got very stoic when I saw that this process works. And I decided that I should probably show you this, especially if you plan to take on further chemistry classes or if you think that this material is kind of interesting because there's a lot of cool stuff associated with it. So hopefully you can appreciate that. Um, okay, so... With all of that being said, I'm going to stop this video right here, and on the next video we'll talk about uh, non-standard conditions.